and we have Peter Evans from Expert File. Uh, you'll notice at the end of each uh, row, there's a blue um, questionnaire that survey filled this out, return to the registration desk. If you want to fill them online afterwards, there's a table tends around and say, what's the um, past the uh, website to fill them online after the conference. Enjoy. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to spend this afternoon talking for the next hour about how we can better leverage our faculty experts with the ultimate goal of really enhancing the academic reputation of the institution. It's been interesting as we've watched how media relations has changed over the last few years and how does media in general has changed. And I have spent a lot of time over the last year looking at faculty directories, looking at expert centers on college websites, and most of them are still you know, what you wanted to do 10 years ago and really haven't leveraged what the media is about today and how the media works today. When a journalist wants a story on something, they are instantly on the social media looking for resources. And I think there's an opportunity for us to really take a different approach to how we look at our faculty experts and how we can get their information out, making it easy for people to find that. So here's just a quick overview of my background and Peter's background. Um, trying to keep things kind of fun and light here, so it's not the official way out here. Peter's talking about how I love music and rescue dogs and all that kind of fun stuff. Same with Peter, I still want to get over and see Peter's Gibson guitar collection at some point. So, real quick overview of the agenda today. I won't read through that, but we're gonna just give you an overview about how to think of you know, about your faculty differently, and then share a lot of our experiences over the last year or two as we have worked with colleges and universities building out expert centers using some of the new tools that are available to us. So let's talk a little bit about why experts matter. And when you think about how the news is trying to find people to talk about the latest breaking news story, one of the big things that has changed is the real-time news cycle. So we've got to come up with methods that let people journalists find information and find it quickly because that story, I did a presentation last year called Own the Second Paragraph. And typically what happens is that when a news story breaks in the first paragraph are the who, what, where, but the why piece is in the second paragraph and that's where they're looking for, fact, for, looking for experts. And the big advantage that we have is that by default, we have a lot of experts on our campuses. So we really want to come up with better ways to get the media mentions that we all, all really would like to see. So some of the key things about building reputation with experts, key benefits. One is just your increased market visibility. You know, the whole idea of earned media. A lot of times when you're talking about earned media these days, you're talking about tweets, you're talking about mentions on social media. But I like to think about earned media, getting yourself on CNN, getting yourself on PBS. Really, you know, the advantages of that are huge. And when you do a faculty directory right now and really leverage your experts, you have this, the opportunity to do that. Get higher online visitor engagement. People are really engaged with stories, especially if you are doing content with your experts beyond just the typical bio and maybe a list of their, their, their CV and some of the articles that are written. If you provide much more compelling content with video and with infographics and all the new things that we can do around your faculty content, much more engaging. And you know, one of the things we're trying to do, whether it's inquiries from students, whether it's inquiries from the media, making our alumni proud, all of that you can do if you start you know, building your reputation, utilizing your faculty. So um, we're going to take a look at three research studies that have been done over the past little while. The first one is from the IT, and Peter, help me with this. Right. IT Services so Service Marketing Association. And they took a look and found that subject matter experts are the highest rated source of credible information. A lot of us think about peer-to-peer -peer and the advantages of having you know, friends make um, recommendations about things, but this research actually showed that subject matter experts provide even a higher level of credibility than that peer-to-peer -peer review. The second one here is from Forrester Research. And in this, in this research, they talked about how important thought leadership is. That's a buzzword we hear a lot about now. And if you think about the advantage we have on a college campus is we truly have thought leaders. We truly have experts. And you know, we need to take advantage of, of how we can get those people out in front of media, out, out in front of all of our constituents. 
And the third one here was interesting to me, looking at you know one third of the searches on LinkedIn are by people looking for an expert on something within their own company. And one of the things that I think we do a poor job in higher ed of is really building pride internally around the work that gets done on a college campus. Um, I'm fairly fortunate because I actually work out of the provost office, so I'm more connected to faculty than a lot of people in my position. I'm more connected to the research that's going on. And it is always amazing to me how many cool things are happening on your campus that nobody knows about, both internally and externally. And I think one of the goals is really to uncover those stories and be able to share, you know, sometimes talking about, I was an economics major, so if you talk about actually pre you know, Freakonomics, economics was pretty boring. One of the things I liked about Freakonomics is it made economics a little more exciting field. Same thing can happen on your campus where if you are talking about something that, you know, and, and the language you're using is what you would see in an economic journal, that's not gonna resonate as much with people as telling that story a little bit different. I'll get into that in a little more detail in a second. So let's dive in now into telling your story with faculty. A friend of mine, Andy Carrier, I don't know how many of you follow his blog, he's based out in Missouri. He wrote this back in 2011, and it was about thinking like a media organization. And it's the idea of content marketing. Um, the way that journalism has changed and media has changed over the last few years is that it's getting harder and harder to get your stories out into the mainstream media. And the idea behind this blog post is that we in higher education need to start thinking like we are our own media company. We need to be able to create our own content and then you know, leverage that content, get that out in front of people. So really a different mindset in terms of thinking how a, you know, we need to think about both media relations and just content creation and content marketing. So one of the things that a lot of companies struggle with when it comes to content marketing is where does that content come from? And in higher ed, that is not the problem that we have. We actually have faculty producing great content all of the time. The challenge, though, is how do you take that content that is typically locked away in academic journals and make that more accessible to the public and make it resonate more with the public? I don't know how many, you know, I don't read a lot of academic journals, but most of them are very dry, very boring, and it's hard for people to relate back to the value in that. But if we can repurpose that content, we're going to be in a much better place. So four key things to think about with your experts. The very first one is credibility. And it's interesting, you know, if I go on LinkedIn and look at people's job titles and look at, you know, kind of their descriptions, it seems like everybody's an expert in something. And at some point, the word expert doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, the, again, the advantage we have in higher ed is that people with a PhD after their name have gone at least through some vetting process, hopefully that they have the expertise in that particular area. So there's automatic credibility that the faculty on a college campus have that maybe some others don't. The second is being engaging. And this can be a challenge when you're working with your faculty because many of them are very smart, um, create lots of interesting research, but might not be the people you want to put in front of a TV camera or on a radio interview. So find the people who have the expertise and can be engaging is something that is, you know, you really need to think about. I'll share with you an article that gets at how to do that in a little while. Third thing is they need to be relevant. And this is the challenge of the real-time news cycle, is that the old days of putting out a press release about, or let me use a different example, the old days of having cool stories in an alumni magazine that went out maybe twice a year, they weren't necessarily timely. And time breaks so fast now that you want to be able to get things that are out relevant with a story that's happening today. And finally, being responsive, being able to respond when a journalist calls, you want to be able to you know, make sure that we can make that connection very, very quickly. So a few things about faculty. Um, in my opinion, faculty are an institution's most important asset. Um, a lot of people in the web world where I'm from and the IT world, even in the marketing world a little bit, have an interesting relationship with faculty. I don't think they fully understand you know, what faculty are up against in the world they live in. But at the end of the day, in fact, I had a provost who worked at UB this was about 15 years ago, walk into a meeting of all mid-level and senior level managers at the university, probably 300 people in the room, and basically said, the work you do is great, but at the end of the day, faculty are more important, and that's where we're hired. A tough message to that crowd 
But as I thought about it, that's very true. Because if you think about the fundamental mission of the university, it's to teach, learn, and if you're a place like UB, you're to do research. That's what the faculty do. So at the end of the day, that are that is really the institution's most important asset. Second is, is the ultimate differentiator between you and your competitors. So if you want to take engineering at UB, or if you want to take engineering at RIT right down the road, the biggest difference between those programs is going to be the faculty and the way they teach. So you need to really understand and, and you know take advantage of your faculty as a way to differentiate yourself from your competition. Um, it's my belief that the academic, academic reputation of a college or university really is the aggregate expertise of all of your faculty. You know, we all want to be ranked really high in U.S. News and World Report, other ranking magazines. And at the heart of a lot of that is the academic reputation of the institution, and at the heart of that is the work that your faculty do. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to get more stories out there about the work that your faculty are doing, and then directly and indirectly, you will start to, you know, really impact some of those rankings and ratings. So here is the biggest problem, is that most of the content that our faculty are producing is incomprehensible to most of us. So let me share with you um, a quick story. Let me just go on to this. About Carl Sagan. So most of you know Carl Sagan. I actually had the opportunity to meet with Carl Sagan, and it was probably the highlight of my 30-year career where I solved a problem that Carl Sagan couldn't solve. If you want to see me afterwards, it's like a 20 minute story, I don't want to share it now, but it was actually a pretty incredible experience. Um, the thing about Carl Sagan though, is most of you know him from books he has written, um, seeing him on PBS, seeing space, seeing the cosmos, and at the end of the day though, he was a faculty member at Cornell, who wrote hundreds and hundreds of research papers. His value to Cornell was that he could take his you know, unbelievable intelligence and relate that to people in a way that they understood. Think about the value of Cornell that Carl Sagan brought to them. And the problem we have is we don't have a lot of Carl Sagans out there, but I think if you did some work on your campus, you could find people who are engaging or doing interesting work and really you know, start to get that out. But let me share with you another story from the University of Buffalo. This is one of our research centers. We have hundreds of research centers at UB. One of them is called the Center for Research and Education in Special Environments. Very catchy title. It is buried in the medical school about three stories. It's actually buried underground. Most people on campus do not know it exists. If you go to their website, you will see a very ugly, very actually if you can find their website, you will find a very poorly done website written in academic language, nobody understands it, and it doesn't really do any benefit in terms of public relations or media relations or anything like that. Um, I came across this because I used to coach lacrosse at UB, and my players used to be volunteers, human subjects, in this lab. They have a cyclotron there, they have um, an accelerator, they can put a, a human into a cyclotron and get you up to 10 Gs, and you know, my, my lacrosse guys would volunteer to do that kind of work, actually got paid very good money. So the problem is that if we talk about press in this manner, nobody's going to relate to that. But one of the most interesting things they did, and I don't know how many people will remember this, is back in the 2004 Olympics, there was swimwear that was developed that was very controversial because it made swimmers too fast. How many people remember that story? The technology behind that was done at UB and Crest. That's the kind of story that should be out there, out in the public. And that's the thing that people can relate to. Think about the impact that would have on potential students. Really cool research that's going on. Donors would love to see that kind of story get out in the news. I can almost guarantee you that 99% of the people at UB had no idea that that happened in UB. They don't even know this facility exists. So that's the kind of thing that we really got to think about is how do we get all of those hidden experts and all of the cool, great things happening on your campus out in front of people a little bit better. Um, let me share with you two good resources that are case studies about the value of faculty expertise. The first was in um, the M. Stoner book, Social Works. This came out a couple years ago. It's a collection of case studies about the power of social media. If you haven't read this book, you should read this book. One particular case study talked about the University of Nottingham. And what they did during the 2010 elections over in the UK 
is they had their faculty experts in political science writing a blog about what was going on in the election. And immediately, because of the power of social media, even back in 2010, it got a lot of readership. The BBC started to pick it up. They got quoted everywhere. And it really was very powerful to get the University of Nottingham's name out in ways that maybe otherwise they couldn't have. So one really good case study. The second one was in the recent, I think it was the January edition of Current Magazine from Case. And this got into the details about how Duke runs their media relations center. This is available. You don't have to be on um, subscribe to Case or Currents to see this. In fact, I looked last night to make sure it's available online for free. It is. Really good article. It's only about four pages long, but it gets into the details about what they've done with media relations and how they leverage their faculty experts in a way that really has been engaging. And you know, one of the key roles that I play is actually on the admission side of things and the ability to um, even help with you know attracting prospective students through this kind of work is really detailed in that on that article. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Peter and let him take over and start talking about some of the trends and some of the things he's experienced. That's all yours. Thanks, Mark. Um, I should have argued with Mark as to who would go first on this because he's really tough to follow. Uh, but really the flow of this presentation is really, it's a two-part presentation. I think Mark's done a really excellent job of giving you the why experts and why they're important to sort of reinforce that academic view that uh, we do have a very important asset that we're underutilizing. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through some formative trends that we're seeing at Expert File and as a company with our clients. And we're gonna talk a lot about uh, the how and the what and what, what are some of the more interesting things that are being done out there in the marketplace by not only uh, the folks that we work with but um, in general. So a couple of trends I want to take you through is the notion of discovery and how information is increasingly being filtered by search engines like Google and other digital needs. I want to talk about the changing nature of influence and build on some of the things that Mark actually talked about. Uh, where we're actually seeing the value of experts rising in a very big way and in some ways outpacing uh, the value of peer-to-peer -peer recommendations in areas like B2B, complex purchases. Where should I go for grad school? Where should I send my kid to school? Should I make a major donation? That's what I would call a complex purchase. And we can actually in some ways model off of B2B buying behavior because it mimics rather than a consumer purchase of where should I eat tonight, which is a lot less consideration but for some of the foodies, it might be more. Um, with visual content, I want to talk about the power of multimedia because many academic institutions are sadly lacking when it comes to presenting multimedia in a variety of different formats on their academics. I want to talk about the power of real time and how speed is actually becoming one of the biggest factors to you actually being successful in differentiating your school's reputation with key audiences like the media. And lastly, I want to talk about the power of metrics. Increasingly, deans, provosts, presidents, and dare I say marketing, communications, and um, public affairs people are under increasing pressure to do more with less and to show an ROI on the investments that they're making. With things like experts, it's no different. So let's dive in on some of these right now. Discovery is, is something we talk about a lot, but I've been fascinated by how Google is eating the world. And you know, uh, full disclosure, I'm a Google stockholder. I'm buying more. I highly recommend the stock. They are eating the world. For better or for worse, we are increasingly using Google to moderate and filter the information that we find. Journalists go to Google often first. It may be after they visited something on Twitter or NBC breaking news when they're looking for a media source. If you are not coming up in Google, you've got a big problem, which is why many of us as marketers are fueling a $44 billion content marketing explosion now, trying to get our content out there and to have it properly indexed by search engines like Google. If you are not on you know, developing microsites or websites, if you're not in media, school ranking websites like US News or McLean's in Canada, if you're not getting blogs and publications and, and if you're not in social media, you could be completely invisible to Google. What we're finding is a formative trend in purchase behavior and, and in consideration uh, when we go online to do that initial research. They're now finding that we do not want to talk to people anymore. We want Google to do most of the work. As many as 57 to 75%, depending on what analyst firm I would quote, 
uh, as much as up to three quarters of the uh, process is, is already over before we want to talk to somebody in admissions. Uh, sometimes three quarters of the process, or in this case 57, uh, to quote serious decisions, uh, that process is already over with before we even uh, talk to somebody internally. On influence, the other major trend that we're seeing is kind of a stabilization around peer-to-peer -peer recommendation. It's still very important. But the need for subject matter experts to be seen and heard uh, through digital media is extremely important. So getting your profs tweeting, getting your profs blogging, getting their expert profiles into the website and giving them a really strong visual representation is good for business. The thing that I, I think is, is interesting too that I don't have time to show is the Edelman Trust Barometer is increasingly showing if you look up their site that the CEOs and the big talking heads are seen by the public and by buyers, and in this case, I, I mean any audience that's coming to your website, they're seen uh, to be on message and very, very in control and they're often seen as sort of uh, puppets. You can almost see the hand moving from public affairs. However, come down a few levels into director level, uh, that would be the same for academics and profs. When they're speaking, they actually have a lot more credibility. There's a human side to the organization and it's a little bit more interesting and contextual as opposed to just following the talking notes. The other uh, trend that I wanted to just briefly touch on is how we're seeing an incredible concentration of applications from a mobile perspective. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that mobile is also eating the world, but video is as well. And we're seeing now some of the research coming in that's showing that YouTube is accounting in some cases for upwards of close to 20%, one fifth of all mobile traffic. So if you are not utilizing Vimeo, YouTube, and even desktop video um, in your formats digitally, you're leaving an awful lot on the table. Uh, show of hands, does anybody know what video does versus text on a, on a general basis? Fran, maybe uh, you know, I'll put you on the spot. It's, it's, yeah. In terms, of, yeah, seven, seven is one of the numbers I've heard as a baseline. Cisco's done some research, PR Newswire, uh, there's tons of academics doing research. Anywhere from seven to 66,000 times I've seen research. Now, somebody's wrong in all that. I'm sure it's the one on the high side. But let's just take the low one that I've seen, seven times more effective than text. But what do we do? We plaster these big, long biographies on our academics, and we believe that people are really reading that stuff. They're not. Sure. Yeah. There's an optimal time length. Yeah. People will not watch all of something that doesn't engage. Yeah. It, it depends, it depends on how deep the research is. I'm hearing optimal lengths as much as eight to 10 minutes if you really try to get in somebody's head to understand their work. So that's almost like a mini NPR style interview. Is it, is it audio or video is also an important break. If you're really trying to get into just a very basic topic and set something called likability, you cannot convey likability with text. Video does that. But you can do that in as little as 60 seconds. And you're seeing Bloomberg and various other media networks now doing a lot of 60 second reels. And in the Nottingham case study that Mark referenced, um, they actually did 60 second video clips with the props. You know what's really amazing about that is less is more. Because if I'm really just trying to get somebody to go to the blog, 60 seconds is good. Plus, he or she is quite busy. They don't, you know, sort of squirm as much in the chair. And in post-production, 60 seconds is a lot easier to get out. So in some cases, these long formats are sometimes overcomplicating what we're trying to do because speed is important. In the election cycle, Nottingham found that getting daily diet out there before 12 noon was really important when the reporters are on deadline. So I think, uh, and Cisco's done a lot of research in saying that two minutes seems to be an optimal format for a very quick sort of uh, interview where I can get enough information to know that you are credible. Uh, it's engaging enough, I got into the story and I got out. And chances are, I'm gonna, I, after two minutes, it, it, there, it comes down that uh, diminishing returns curve. Does that help? Yes, right, and I, do, I had seen research, it's a little dated now, it's probably three years ago, that said optimal video between two minutes and two minutes and 30 seconds, so that kind of takes in that. Yeah, and just for anybody that's listening, the question was optimal video formats, and we can talk about that offline until the cows come home. Some great research out there that I can share with you. This is a great graph. Everybody that sees this in higher ed wants a copy of it. I'm gonna mention as well that all these slides will be shared 
uh, except some of the naughty bits where I show a few metrics from schools and stuff. Uh, this one's interesting, Burson Marsteller, a shout out to them, who actually did a, a sort of diffusion uh, curve to show how social drives um, the conversation in the first 90 minutes. So if you're not on Twitter, or you're not following Twitter, you're not doing what a lot of the journalists are doing. And how media is really moving is we're seeing that an eyewitness may actually post something on their iPhone to a cloud-based service. And the reporters are actually saying, can I use the footage? You've seen that in Twitter before. Can we use the photo of that car accident, the rail you know, disaster, whatever it is. Um, and then what you're finding is after 90 minutes, we're seeing a diffusion to online publishing. So where I am in, in Toronto, it would be CP24, which is our, our sort of quick hit, um, round the clock news. Then it's gonna move to radio broadcasts. That'll be local affiliates and possibly national. Then it's gonna go to TV shortly afterwards. But we're actually, you know, a couple of hours in now before it actually gets there. Social is very important, more than anybody thought. This is actually a 32 hour cycle. Um, and you're in some cases a lot farther down by the time it's getting to press. And at the very end of this, it's Economist, Time Magazine, those long format op-ed pieces and such. Um, the main thing here is about speed. And what we're now seeing that the need to get your uh, experts inserted into the real-time news cycle is absolutely paramount. How many people have heard of David Merriman Scott? Uh, he's one of our advisors on um, the expert file uh, board. Um, David I wrote a book called Newsjacking. He wrote a book called uh, New Rules of Marketing and PR, which the case folks actually promote quite a bit in their bookstore at the different events. I highly recommend that you get a copy. Uh, version number uh, five is coming out. It's in 27 languages. I, when I go out to Wheaton and some of the other clients we have, I often see it on the bookshelf for our clients. A lot of our clients are very progressive around this. David is all about, well, he's all about a lot of things, but one of the things that he really pushes is speed. He's saying that the ability to serve journalists when they are in this zone uh, in Twitter and actually trying to find expert sources, there is a hugely disproportionate value to, your, uh, to you getting uh, an expert source to them in this cycle. Do you really think it matters over here if you've got the best person in the world? And by the way, from a speed perspective, it's not about the best anymore. They don't need to be from Harvard. Maybe somebody at Binghamton's got much better than good enough information, but they're available. I think uh, Woody Allen got it right when he said, you know, 80% of it is showing up. And we need to do a better job of showing up on the right media channels at the right time. And lastly, I think metrics are very important as well. Uh, sorry, this got cut off on the bottom, but the three things that we look at from a metrics perspective that we track in our platform are the content contribution metrics from the academic. What do they have to give you as a marketing person? And how are you working with them to move some of that content onto the website in digital formats where it can be used? Whether it's snackable or longer form content, a mixture of those different things. So looking at a view of all of the different content assets in a sort of Bloomberg-like dashboard is something that our clients are enjoying. Then the audience engagement is about uh, the kind of traffic that you're getting on different faculty profiles, the viewing time that's actually happening. And the last one is being able to track individually by inquiry type, the kind of metrics that are coming in. So we've got a school, for instance, that is getting inquiries that they never thought they'd get before. Expert witness inquiries from the US military for a Canadian school on a very important topic for a military court martial, uh, looking for expert witnesses in a very specific area of research. Uh, IEEE Magazine coming in from California, very important magazine that uh, wanted to interview an expert on wearable computing and such. So a range of different inquiry types that are coming in that you should be tracking, everything from media, conference organizers, donor requests, student requests, both grad and undergrad, as well as partnership opportunities coming in from other academics that may be seeing that content and wanting to collaborate, as well as corporates. However, you know, when I show these trends and I sort of go through this analysis, we've actually figured out uh, a way to grade schools. So I, I love this, you know, we're all academics, so everybody loves a grade, they love a score. So we've actually developed a proprietary model, and you can argue with a couple of things here and there, but we wanted to at least get a level set for the industry to allow a dean or a marketing department or a president of a school to know if they're winning or losing. Most schools are losing. 
The average score that we're getting in the market uh, in North America wide across US and Canada, uh, and we've gone way beyond 300 schools we did on the research, are only scoring at about 28 out of 100 points. What we've done is we've allocated uh, a sort of algorithmic model across five major factors. Are you discoverable? Is your website, when we go to it, can we discover content very quickly? Can we find experts? We love the one, and this is the one we laugh at the most on discoverability, is where you go to the site and it's a really bad faculty directory and it's only searchable by name. It, and, and almost assuming that the user, when they get there, a media joke about this as well, that you already know the names of all the faculty. You're, you're not in a good place if you don't know everybody's name. So we think the whole notion of searching by name only doesn't really work, or the, the often alphabetical search. Uh, so the idea of having searchable text boxes in, in free form search is absolutely key. The second one is credibility. Uh, what we see is basic biographies for about 73% of the sites. Uh, it's amazing how there aren't biographies. That means you know, almost a quarter of the school is still not doing it. But it's just left to text. And it's big, boring biographies, sometimes a really boring, outdated headshot. And we think that's getting the job done. And we're completely missing a lot of other things uh, around engagement as well. And only 4% of faculty profiles have videos right now on, on site. And again, I wouldn't say it's statistically significant. We haven't sort of validated it across the gold standard. But over 300 sites, uh, it's starting to get there. It's very interesting. Only 4% using video. Uh, and there's so many different ways of incorporating multimedia these days. We also find it interesting that from a responsiveness perspective, what we mean by that is how easy it is it to reach somebody for comment as media, or if I'm reaching out for a collaboration opportunity with that person. There are many different ways that you can collect information or, or um, uh, dial in and, and such, but what we're finding is, is that many schools are hiding behind a phone number. Uh, in some cases, you've got email that just goes directly to the academic and nobody gets back to you. That's also not a passing grade just to have that because most of the marketers tell me that they feel out of the loop. And, and everybody, I think, in this room, if they're in comms for a while, has a really bad horror story about a major news outlet that called in and the academic didn't get back to them. And I'm not blaming academics because they are busy people. Sometimes it hasn't even been socialized with them, the importance of their expertise, And to Mark's point. And the ability for you to be in the loop on a real-time basis is absolutely essential. Uh, and lastly, we're seeing that only 22% of the websites that we've evaluated across North America are actually optimized for mobile devices in terms of having responsive HTML5. Most of the browsers on mobile now, to my knowledge, are, are, are really running um, in ways that are, are very different. And with the latest algorithm that Google's got for mobile, has anybody heard about this? If you're coming in on a mobile device, they're suppressing search results, uh, which is actually very troublesome for websites that are not mobile optimized. What are they trying to do? They're trying to drive relevance for users. And what they're saying is, we as Google do not want to serve up a bad experience for a user. We don't want to send them to a website that isn't properly optimized for that mobile device. And they can tell with the NIC card and the other identifiers um, that that is a mobile device coming into the Google search engine. This is bad, and as well, a number of schools are offside in terms of ODA and AODA requirements as publicly funded institutions. We see this all the time because we work with academic institutions as well as large hospital networks that require those standards to be met for Americans with disabilities and such. So I'm going to very quickly run you through a couple of design tips with respect to expert centers and how we're seeing some of the trends. A uh, couple of the schools that we work with right now, just to give you a sense, uh, I guess here we're establishing some degree of credibility because we this isn't our first rodeo. We've, we've done this with schools. Uh, large and small, and you'll see one of those is in the SUNY system there, a little trick question. We're excited because we met Farmingdale at SUNY 5 last year, and it's been a great ride with Katie Green and the staff there and with Sonia. Uh, this is Farmingdale um, showing you a sneak peek, spoiler, spoiler alert of the new Farmingdale website that's being set up for their faculty and on the update, which uh, you know they're they're just doing a refresh of the page, and we can show you more of this later. The first thing I'd like you to think about is objectives. Um, in many cases, I, I do see higher education similar to corporate in that money does matter at the end of the day, 
as uh, Ben Horowitz from the famous VC firm, uh, Andreessen Horowitz says, you know, it's not about the money. It's all about the blank money. <laughs> Um, and you can fill in that blank, but it is important. When I talk to advancement people, uh, when I talk to uh, people in research and tech transfer, when I talk to people in uh, student recruitment uh, positions, they are often under pressure to bring in more with less. So what we're doing with our clients right now is really aligning those objectives with the type of content programs that they need to deploy. And then we're saying, okay, where can we move that stuff? How can we do featured faculty and students uh, in our platform? How can we look at digital signage solutions and how can we start to move expert content across many different areas of the, of the school website? And I want to expand your thinking on that a bit. Uh, first of all, you've got to get all of your content together. I want you to think about content and all the fields that go into detailed faculty profiles that are usable by journalists, conference organizers. Things like speaking fees might not occur to you but if, uh, if that faculty would like to be flown to a really good conference that could build a reputation for the school and somebody's willing to pay, that's something you might want to include. Sample presentations and talks. What am I speaking on today? What have I spoken on in the past? My portfolio, videos, slides, photos, my audio, radio interviews. I'm amazed at how many schools fail to actually catch the TV broadcast and get just a basic cell phone photo that's kind of straightly shot of that person with that CNN logo or there, uh, or you know Buffalo News, where it instantly conveys credibility without even putting the video in there. But I'd like you to really expand your thinking around the different types of fields that you could be doing. And you can just see in comparison, what we're doing today is really a 1.0 version. Uh, and what you see on the right is actually David Merman Scott's profile um, on Expert Fund. I'd like you to think about topics. This is a quick exercise that we do with clients, and I unfortunately am amazed when I talk to many comms people. When I quiz them about who the rock stars are, they're, they're experts, they often will get the first couple out there, and then it starts to trail off. They're not as in touch with the research, they're not as in touch with the stories as I would like to see them. And I think we, we have some things that we can talk to you offline about that can really help with that. But at a formative level, one of the first things you want to do is you want to figure out, okay, who are we working with? I'm going to lead you through a real quick exercise. University Health Network is affiliated with the University of Toronto. They are by far one of the largest health systems in the world, actually, and certainly the biggest in Canada. We've got four teaching hospitals, 1,500 docs, 15,000 employees across four major hospitals, eight different sites around the GTA in Toronto. And I'm based in downtown Toronto. Um, University Health Network then is Toronto General, it's, uh, it's the Toronto Western, Princess Margaret, which is big for cancer, and Toronto Rehab, which is rehabilitation medicine. TGH is one of those properties within the UHN family. Within the UHN's uh, uh, Toronto General Hospital, Peter Monk from American Barrack actually gives a lot of money and opens up the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre. This is a named donation. Now at this stage, We've got two rock stars here, Dr. Heather Ross and Dr. Torone David, who came in and accepted the chair, a big Brazilian guy. He's come into Canada now and he's, he's killing it over there. I shouldn't say that, it's not a good expression in, uh, for a cardiologist, but you get the idea. Yes, I'm killing it. Uh, so uh, don't tweet that, please. Uh, so Dr. Torone David, but, but what, do they, what do they do? Do they, you know, and just beating the topics out of our clients is the first thing we need to do. Cardiovascular uh, surgery, myocardial, myocardial infraction, uh, heart failure function and organ donation. And she also happens to be an expert on patient transplant for organ donation and some of the other ancillary activities that go on when you donate that. What's really powerful here is when you start to break down your topics. If you want to start at the top, great. If you want to start at the bottom, great. You've got to have a syntax. You've got to start mapping this stuff out. Start with a spreadsheet. We'll give you a couple of tools that will help with that to get you going. Uh, we would be delighted to show you some topic tagging exercises that we do. And then you can see Heather Ross and Dr. Tony David, Dr. Tony David in the UHN Expert Center. Um, this is actually integrated completely into their SharePoint 2010, which they're not crazy about, but uh, they don't really want to spend a lot of money and forklift upgrade that, so they've integrated our software directly into that. 
But what I think is really neat is they're thinking very progressively about formats. I want you to think formats. Every piece of expert content can be in directory format. It can be a news spotlight uh, where you publish select experts based on breaking news. We have a really interesting feature called Spotlight, which is, I believe, the new version of the press release because it actually allows you to tweet breaking news, or sorry, publish breaking news, and tag all of your experts in your pre-built database and push that news out in two minutes as opposed to waiting two days to figure out what everybody's going to do about the breaking news. Remember what we said about Twitter before. You've got a golden period of about 90 minutes before it starts to diffuse. Detailed profiles, media carousels, expert features that can go on areas uh, throughout the website. And then don't think just about a directory. It's about the home page. It's your foundation if you have one. It's your newsroom. It's your program areas. It's your research. The idea of, of looking at it as a sort of atomized content, it's portable. It, it lives and breathes all over the place. And you actually need specialized software, not just a garden variety CMS to actually do this because you're creating category views in the database and different sort of relationships with the profile information contextually related to the audiences that are coming in. What I just said is a mouthful, but when we show you how simple it is to do, I think we'll end up changing your thinking a little bit more and taking some of the constraints off. It's like that Porsche ad, you feel like that puppy when the leash breaks. In many ways, Marcom people, I think, have not had a system that really enables them to publish across the website in ways that they want. The more advanced tips, I'll ask you to, to think like the pros. I'm going to call Duke pros. They could do better with their website. That's a, that's a challenge to them right now. Uh, but I would say this. They have a very competent media relations team based on the kind of case study work that was published in uh, the case current. I was extremely uh, interested and excited to see what they were doing. I'm not going to go through all this, but we actually have a copy of a case study coverage sheet that we did that's in our booth, and I'd love you to pick it up because it's really quite detailed about the playbook. We broke down the Duke success factors into 10 major things that we caught Duke doing really well. And we think that's very powerful, and it's also on our blog as well. But a couple that I would throw in is that they opted in their faculty experts into different degrees of involvement. Some people are not right for TV or radio, but they may want to write a blog. Have you actually gone out to a group of your faculty and opted them in for different jobs to be done that help you as a marketing professional in telling your story? If you're in advancement or enrollment, the same thing. If you have a responsibility as a storyteller, I think what behooves us is to show them a way that they are going to be showcased in a more professional way, but then to also ask them what their contribution is going to be. And mark my words, I think over the years, we are going to be talking as marketing people around the room about contribution indexes. I believe contribution indexes need to be a part of our metrics as marketers as we start to think about content marketing. How can we not understand where the sources are for that content? So building faculty profiles is a very formative part of that. But strategizing with your faculty, bringing them into some Marcom meetings, not all of them, but some of the people that you want to feature and nurture. But I think one of the most exciting things in all of these plays that Duke did was that they are publishing expert quotes on the website every day. And they're finding now, as the article suggested, that this isn't just small regional media that are coming to the website and lifting those quotes that are ready to go. It's like AP. Associated Press has done that. Why? It's not surprising to me because journalists are being asked to do three times as much work now. And it is becoming very important for them to do um, a lot more, but also have a journalistic integrity and also to retain the credibility of those sources. You have a very enviable slot in this whole ecosystem here as academics by representing this incredible resource that Mark talked about, you have a very enviable position here that corporations don't have. There's an incredible trust, as we talked to before, that allows you to get stuff out if you can engage those faculty to publish faster and to get stuff that media need right away when they need it in that first 90 minutes, it's great. Now this is getting a little washed out and I won't belabor this, but it just thinks about or just suggest to you that you should also think integrated platform. 
this isn't really a one-off thing. When we talk to our clients, many of them are visionaries, and I think they understand that they're playing the long game with experts. This isn't just some sort of a feel-good campaign that we're gonna do just for capital uh, or for a student push to you make up a shortfall. I think you really need to, when you get into the expert game, be committed for the long haul. And I think what we're seeing here is that people are committed to a new publishing strategy. They're looking to drive market visibility in areas like search engine optimization organically and not just paying for media, whether it be bus shelter ads and billboards, which we're all good at at the end of the day, but this takes a bit of creativity with our experts. They're committed to real-time engagement and making sure that as marketing departments, they are getting the word in and tracking their inquiries properly through the right kind of analytics at the back end. This is really important because they're building a full system here. So at the end of the day, I want you to think results. I think the major things that you want to know when you start getting into expert marketing and the things that uh, the uh, administrators and, and senior people should be asking of their Marcom departments is, so who do we have in the zoo? Who's who in the zoo? What topics do they speak on? Uh, what kind of coverage do we have from a topics perspective? Very few of us could really um, intelligently and competently provide a spreadsheet that shows all the topic coverage that's really up to date, that really is connected to upcoming research and books and everything else. It isn't easy to do, but you start small. I think that's important, but also what kind of traction are you getting in terms of audience engagement? Are you measuring that across the site? Can you actually understand even visually what your topics look like in a cloud? How are our SEO organic results improving in terms of name searches and other things that we do on the props? Are they actually moving up in the rankings? And lastly, the all important inquiries that are coming in. This is deliberately small, by the way, because it's real live data. Um, this is actually a report prototype that we're doing now for one of our university clients. But this is just a summary of some of the inquiries that are coming in from around the globe for different types of uh, um, interest in uh, the faculty. So if you're ready for launch, to just close off. It is not boiling the ocean. Um, as they say, it's kind of like eating the elephant one bite at a time. We encourage many of our clients to start with a, with a small core group of experts to get quick wins. It's like an IT project in some ways. A lot of them die because we overreach and we expect complete user acceptance right away. So you want to be very careful with how you roll it out and, and, and trying to get those first wins are important. Populating your expert information into your system, whatever you're using, is really important, but you also need to communicate the initiative. You've got to organize all of that biographical, uh, multimedia information and other identifiers and pull it from different accounts that are out there. And that can be done very quickly with specialized software. And, and then building the profiles. Uh, one of the things that we found that is a game changer with our clients is we actually build the profiles for our clients. So we have one university that we're doing now in California that is 600 faculty that will be on the platform. 600 profiles, we do, we, we have that done, do you, I think by the, no, we won't have it done by next week. But <laughs> we will work with the, the marketing department does not have the time to do that. And we do that every day and we can do it better, faster and cheaper than internal resources on that. I think that's been one of the biggest stumbling blocks. Third of the fourth steps is to publish. It's getting approvals from the faculty and figuring out whether or not they're even going to uh, look after their own profile. Some of our clients do not want faculty touching anything. Uh, that's okay. It, it comes down to how you want to lay things out strategically. It's, it's getting the technical resources in for a full website integration, activating the profiles, and then communicating that internally that it is going live and stuff. But it isn't enough to just sort of have it sit there and then rely on inbound traffic and magic doesn't start to happen. Uh, unicorns are, are not necessarily going to fly out here. Under the tasks, uh, we've got to actually, at the promotional stage, we've got to advocate for those experts and really start to push into social. Now that we have certain landing pages created, it gets easier to tweak this stuff. 
Uh, we can start aligning more with breaking news because if you don't have to scramble to show credibility on this particular academic, and let's say it's one of the faculty at Farmingdale who happens to be an expert on amusement parks, the roller coaster breaks down at Coney Island on the first day, which it did this year as it opened up. That's a perfect opportunity for breaking news. And if I've already got a profile built on that roller coaster expert, one of their faculty, and I'm forgetting his name now at Farmingdale, uh, it's, it's so easy to actually market that person and do outreach to the media. So it's both inbound and outbound, but it's also rewarding those experts and really making sure uh, you go back to them and, and, and show them that you care and, uh, and thank them for the kind of contributions that they're making to make sure that their profiles are up to date and for their contributions because you're marketing them. So with that, uh, we're going to take some questions in the time remaining. Thank you. Yes, Fred. In terms of getting, promoting your experts to the media, especially since time is of the essence, mm -hmm. what are some tips on, uh, on doing that? So uh, when you say uh, promoting them to the media, I mean, the I mean, I'm sorry? The roller coaster. Yeah, it's a perfect one. I mean, I, you know, first of all, Farmingdale's on Long Island, and then Coney Island, I don't know the exact geographics, but not too far away. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so regional media are, are generally, for the most part, going to be very accepting of, a, of a, a regional expert that's got perspective. They do like to favor the local team in many ways, but that person still needs to be credible. So one of the things you can do immediately is reach out to some of the media contacts that you already have in your directory. A lot of you might be running Decision Database or PR Newswire. I mean, many of you in media relations already have those established relationships. Nothing in this game allows you to short circuit and not have any relationships because you're going to get a better effect. But you know what you need to do, and it's something that is happening with University Health Network. They're going out to journalists and now they're saying they're open for business. And what Jillian Howard, I think, is doing very effectively is she's really sending a message to journalists that we have some of the best doctors in the world here, and we're going to make your lives easier. I think the major message to the journalists is to say that you have credible sources, and, and that the, the credibility is self-evident from the amount of information and how snackable the content is. So a Chase producer is going to evaluate the suitability of those people and, and you're going to get more bookings. You'll see things happening. Uh, from an outreach point of view, you, you also need a unique angle on the story. You just can't say, hey, the roller coaster broke down. You've got to say, hey, we've actually talked with our faculty. It's available for comment. And he's got a couple of angles that you may not have thought about. Here's what actually happens when that happens and what goes on. Because I need to cover it. I can't just say roller coaster broke down, end of story. I need something unique. David Meerman Scott is a master at this. And his book, News Jacket, is like a $5 purchase, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but it's, it's an e-book. I can't believe David hasn't actually, he's too busy with all his other books to publish it. But it's very affordable um, on, uh, as an e-book if you type it, News Jacking. And he's coined that term. Newsjacking uses principles of kind of a, a, you have to be in there right away with the best possible angle, and it's not the best expert in the world. Newsjacking as well favors the fast, not the best. Harvard's not going to be in on the amusement park story. Uh, I'll give you an example. Angelina uh, Jolie had her ovaries removed recently, um, and it was an issue with, I mean, she's got a genetic predisposition that suggests she may have ovarian cancer if she doesn't do this. It's a very radical, invasive procedure. Well, we started lighting up. We had broadcast media coming in, going through expert files, searching on ovarian cancer and different variations that they may have done. And they immediately, our clients were getting uh, inquiries from broadcast media. That is the moment. But they may have gone to four or five different schools. They may have gone to different clinics and stuff. And they may be going globally on this because the, the information is Googleable. You are competing with these other people. So speed, uh, the right angle, uh, credibility, all that stuff, you got to be firing properly. You have to be ready to go. That's the problem with this. It, there is no shortcut on it. Mark, just, if you haven't read that article about what Duke does, read that, because they do a really good job of the proactive rather than reactive. So they meet every day for 30 minutes to talk about what's in the news, what faculty do we have that might be able to address those stories. Mm -hmm. So again, read that article. The other thing that's interesting to me is that 
Um, I took a look at all of the expert centers at AAU institutions, Association of American Universities, the 65 biggest research universities in the country, thinking that they're going to have really good expert centers that you know, do a lot of research. What I found was most of them were awful. In fact, some of them were broken. I'm not going to name who this is, but you would go there and it would say, site to be updated, nothing there, and it was dated 2012. I will say this is a Big Ten school. I'll give you that much of it. You also got 404 errors where they weren't even loading. Some so think codes. about if I'm a journalist who comes across something and I go to this institution looking for an expert and that's the message I get. It's, it was amazing to me how little time and effort had been put into just a basic even directory. And then as Peter mentioned, they're making it easy to search for something. So again, the thing I like about what Duke did is they, again, more proactive than reactive. They have thought ahead of time knowing that they're not, you know, real news happens so quickly now that you've got to be ready, you've got to be paying attention, set up, you know, if there's, if you know you're good, I'm trying to think of a good UV example. At the University of Buffalo, we have good, we have an earthquake research center. Mm -hmm. So we should be setting up Google searches on, and looking on Twitter to see if there, anything about an earthquake is ever mentioned. And then immediately you get out there saying that, here's somebody who's an expert on that. Mm -hmm. You know, at the front of that real time news cycle. So takes a little bit of time and effort, but that's where the reward comes. And one of the things I think about a lot is just the value of media mentions. In fact, I'd love to have a conversation with anybody here about how do we quantify? What is the true ROI of a media mention? Um, this might have to stay in this room. We don't advertise. The University of Buffalo Admissions Office does not advertise in the New York Times. It's too expensive. Think about what the value of a media mention in the New York Times around an earthquake would be. Not only is it free advertising, free uh, free mention? It carries a lot more credibility because there was no advertising involved. So again, the value of them to be able to get out there and you know. And the other thing I would say is that this applies not to just the big research university, but it applies to everybody. Everybody's got experts in something. Um, if you think about the concept of the long tail, I'll use you know Monroe Community College as an example. I'm sure they have experts in things going on in Rochester. So if there's a story that breaks about Rochester, that's a logical place to go and look. We haven't made a formal announcement about this, but I, I would encourage you, as I think you're reading about this a lot, to think more like a journalist. But I, I can't do that effectively as effectively as a real journalist. So I hired one uh, who's now an advisor to our company uh, and a shareholder. And, and he is a broadcast uh, journalist, TV and radio, 20 years, national TV. Uh, and uh, very decorated, he's won awards, probably the top broadcasting awards. Um, I am seeing the journalist uh, challenges through a whole fresh set of lenses. And I gotta tell you, it's no party. I mean, it's unbelievable. And then, and not only has the workload gone up, the layoffs continue. Um, new media formats like Giga Ohms, uh, I'm trying to remember Matt Ingram's uh, site. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting that right now, a senior's moment. But just failed recently, ventured back to new media startup. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, it being really, really decimated, the media environment, uh, as we move from digital, you know, or sorry, print dollars to digital dimes. A lot of uh, media properties are not uh, making it anymore. So, in fact, there's an incredible gap um, that we're helping fill as universities if we can merchandise. I hate to use that word, but it, it's, it's clever in a way because merchandising suggests that we're making it easier for the journalists to do their job. That's the major thing. Help me do my job and, and make sure that what you give me is credible. And you guys are already in the catbird seat there. You already are in a position. Um, I think as well that experts really, as one of my clients said, you're helping us punch above our weight. I love the notion of punching above your weight class uh, because we often talk about, hey, well, well, we don't have a budget the size of Duke. What I say is, that will be a reality for the foreseeable future. Duke is a machine, they're moving up the rankings, they're doing well on both the US News and Bloomberg rankings. They've really got their act together. But you know what, you can steal some of the plays on the field and really, I think that's how you uh, get leverage with your experts. Any other questions? Any feedback? Anybody got any rants, comments? Anybody here in the audience, a quick show of hands, Who's really happy with what they're doing with their experts right now? You know, you're, you're, you're zen-like, self-actualized from a, <laughs> you know, oh God. There's people actually hiding right now. You can't see this. 
Yes. Yeah. I think um, there. I think uh, you know Jerry Seinfeld was on 60 Minutes the other night. He had a great phrase. He said, "You know, my relationship as an artist with the studio, the TV network, is like men's underwear. I need a certain amount of control, and I need a certain amount of freedom." <laughs> I love that analogy. When we work with academics, we need to think about the two major attributes, the Seinfeld attributes of men's underwear. Probably a tweetable thing, but hopefully you'll, you'll get it in the right order. But I think in many ways, we want to, we have, want to have a certain amount of control as an institution around our content, uh, assembling really nice, snackable, rich profiles that you are organizing and administering. And, and the ability to go in and collaborate with the faculty on that is important but also giving them a certain amount of freedom, whether it's to update their own profile, to keep it more current and fresh. And we have some uh, clients where they're saying it's completely unmanageable if we don't allow them that freedom. Uh, one of our clients uh, would have, theoretically, if every faculty went in every quarter, every three months, and made two minor changes to their bio, or maybe they uploaded a video, they spoke at a conference, or uh, it would create 2,500 changes in the system per year for two overworked media people who we've actually been able to increase their efficiency a lot more because if you do this front end work and you've got all these beautiful profiles, you're now running around just taking over the world with the journalists because you can, you can get on it. You can start to look at breaking news and respond right away with credibility and then think a bit more about the story angles. Um, so I think uh, to your question, I, I don't think there's any loss of control here at all. Maybe control is the right word. Yeah. But but just yeah. yeah, I think I think it's there is no shortcut to this. I think it's again if you get that stuff in, you move away from firefighting mode into a more strategic mode, and we're finding that now. The feedback I've had is that you've really, as a company, challenged us not only with your with your software but your best practices. You're helping us better understand how we can save some time so we can start thinking more strategically about how those faculty fit into different things. And remember. A lot of the questions have been around media. That would certainly be a very big attribute of what we're looking for with experts. But I would like you to think about research partnerships. I'd like you to think about enrollment. We're finding that undergrad, eh, not bad. But when it comes to grad students, if you're trying to build relationships, especially with international and grad students, experts are huge. Because it's about who they're studying with, not just about the program. And that's where it's quite often lacking on the website, their experience when they come to that. So we're getting an incredible response from the enrollment people on this and see advantages to getting better stories out there in different formats. Yes? And in your work, have you come across the case of the reluctant faculty? Absolutely, <laughs> and it's a great question. I appreciate it. And time wasn't permitting here, but I think one of the key things around faculty, and we've seen this in the Nottingham and the Duke studies that actually speak to this, You've got to find an initial gaggle of faculty that are on your side that will play with you. And I, I really think that the leverage that you're going to get will not be from the rock stars. They're already bought in. And in many cases, they're way ahead of you from a digital perspective. You'll never catch up. So ride with that and leverage them. But the bigger leverage for you is in the middle of the tails. It's the middle majority and actually the front end of that middle majority. Don't look at the laggards. They should never be on stage. We never want to put them in the media. Let them go back to their research lab, crawl into the hole, whatever they want to do. <laughs> We've all met them, and, and they're a nightmare, and they're not responsive, as Mark talked about. I think it's very important that we get that leverage in the front of that middle tail. That's the 66%. If we can get those people coming up about five points better, imagine the leverage that we're getting. Do the math on that. It gets really exciting. And remember that what happens with the faculty is, is that they're uh, they need to see that their recognition they're getting is maybe beyond the construct of what they can think of now. We take faculty and we elevate their presence and we give them visibility that's more than what the marketing department's done before. They love it. And in many cases, when you go to expert file, you'll see that there are comparable people in other fields, but we're networking all the academics together with expert file. We don't believe anybody should build a faculty directory or 
or, or put their expert center together and then it just sits there. We want to network them all together at expertfile.com. The academic immediately goes and says, wow, there's, I know that guy or I know that, that lady. She's pretty amazing in our field and she's at a different university. I think I should be there too. So it actually sets up a different dynamic. I will say this, if you are going out and you're showing something that looks crappy, you're going to get what you deserve when you go out to faculty. Many of them will say, listen, I do all this, I fill out the forms, I've got grants, I've got all this other stuff. How does this fit in? Show me the payoff. So start small, move it up, and, and sort of graduate that first class of faculty through your program, which I'm delighted to give you some tips on. And then once you've got that cohort, that's how you do it. You don't try to get 100 people moving all in the same direction immediately. Thank you. Great question. I, I'm really glad you, uh, you asked that. I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. The other sessions are on. Um, thank you so much. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.